Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon and good evening and welcome to another Hasselblad in Space uh, webinar. Uh, welcome, um, I hope you're safe and well uh, depending on where you are in the world at the moment. Um, just to introduce today's webinar, um, Hasselblad in Space, it's the story of how Hasselblad became the first camera uh, to shoot the images of the moon landing. Uh, presenters today is myself, Mark Whitney, I'm the EMA Events Manager. And my colleague that will do the main presentation is Chris Coos. He's the Global Technical Communications Manager. Uh, Chris is actually studying for a um, degree in astronomy. Uh, so he's very knowledgeable, not only on cameras, but also on uh, space itself. So I think we're in for a really good presentation today. So hopefully you can all see my screen. I just wanted to do some housekeeping uh, checks before we got started. So today's webinar has both visual and audible components. So you should be able to see my screen and you should be able to hear me. Uh, for the best experience, it's advised to go um, to join us via desktop or tablet, but it is also possible on a smartphone. So if you're looking that way, that's fine. If you do happen to get disconnected at all, you can reconnect using the same link that we've sent you in your email, or you can use the webinar ID that's there. Uh, please also note that the webinar is being recorded and the recording of the webinar will be available online within a couple of days of the webinar finishing. So you should be able to hear me. If you can't hear me, make sure your computer's default output or um, the correct speakers are selected in your control panel. And you should find that your microphone is muted as default. That's completely normal, uh, but it doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. Uh, just below that, you should have an area where you can enter text questions and we'll do our best to answer them throughout the webinar. Uh, please note that it is very busy, the webinar. We've currently got over 650 people logged in. So I can imagine it's going to get quite busy with um, questions. So inevitably, we won't get around to answering them all. But of course, we'll do our best. And we hope you still enjoy the webinar if we aren't able to answer your question. So just to introduce a little bit more about today's webinar. So obviously, we're a photographic company, and we have a lot of uh, uh, photographers that are following us today from the photography side of the content. But we also have some space enthusiasts. So um, we welcome you and uh, thank you for joining us. We've got a lot more um, info and resources on our space collaborations as well on our website. So even after the webinar, you're able to go to that URL there to, um, to see more information and, uh, and to see more images. So the agenda, quite simply, uh, we'll have the Hasselblad in Space presentation. We estimate this will hopefully run for about 45 minutes. Um, and then that will leave a little bit of time in the end for some Q&A where I'll pick out some of the more uh, sort of interesting questions uh, to hopefully fill the rest of the hour. So if I can just now pass over to my colleague, Chris, and he will take us on uh, for the rest of the webinar. Okay. So over to you, Chris. Yeah, just swap over to my display screen. Hopefully you can all see that now. Good. So, hi everyone. I'll go through this in as much detail as we possibly can uh, in the time constraints. Obviously there's a huge amount of information uh, that we could put across and we just won't have enough time. So uh, I'll do my best. So I suppose you could say this is where everything started. Uh, so a space race, President Kennedy uh, committed the US to uh, landing a man on the moon. Uh, and from Hasselblad's point of view, obviously, we were honored, proud to be part of that. Um, our cameras recorded some of the most fantastic images that you can imagine, uh, and not just through Apollo, but beyond as well, uh, which hopefully we'll get a chance to work through today. So starting at the beginning, we have uh, Project Mercury, which if you like, we're right at the start, single man capsules, some very basic uh, requests from the uh, project, basically to get man into space um, and make sure that they can work and to get back safely. So Mercury 3, right at the start, Alan Shepard. So first American in space, and this was a suborbital, so very short flight just to test systems and to make sure that get up and back safely. No pictures 
were actually taken because obviously um, the initial capsules didn't even have a window. Uh, we literally had a periscope, which according to the astronauts was uh, fairly useless. So by the time we then got on to John Glenn, this was first full orbital flight. So three orbits. And again, uh, at this point, photography wasn't on anybody's agenda. Um, they say that uh, John Glenn looked at taking, uh, he tried a Leica, but uh, in the end, he preferred a little uh, compact Minolta. If you like, our story starts here. Uh, so Mercury 8, Walter Shearer. And uh, he spoke to his friends and said, look, I've seen some of the images that were captured on smaller cameras, and uh, I'm sure we can do better than that. <laughs> And so they said, yeah, try a Hasselblad. So he did just that. So NASA purchased a 500C uh, from a local camera store, literally off the shelf camera from Houston, Texas. Uh, they then proceeded to modify that. Again, technician there, Roland Red, actually did the modifications. Um, but literally, they purchased off the shelf 500 to see to see what it could do. I think you're going to ask a poll there, Mark, weren't you? Yeah, um, <clears throat> and obviously the, the 500C is a very popular camera for Hasselblad over the years. So we just wondered if there was any people on the on the webinar that actually um, did actually have one or still do. Just be in for, interesting for us to know. Okay, so it's about 50-50 at the moment um, as to who did it. So that's that's good, interesting to know. Okay, thank you, Chris. Good. Cool. So, obviously the off-the-shelf camera would need a few modifications, um, but not actually as much as you would think. The standard camera obviously has mirrors, uh, to, to view, a viewfinder, a secondary shutter, and a nice vinyl covering, which is great uh, for normal commercial use, but obviously not much for uh, working in space. So all of these things were removed to reduce the weight. Um, camera was painted matte, matte black to basically minimize any reflections. Um, modifications to the lenses, normally on a Hasselblad, the shutter closes to take the exposure and then will open back up. So obviously you can then view the image again. Uh, with no mirror, no need for that. So the shutter basically was permanently closed except for exposure. The standard film back, uh, the initial back, obviously very small, 12 exposures, and these were modified by a company uh, in the end by Cine Mechanics, sorry, Cine Mechanics, to enable it to take 70 mil film and 70 exposures. Uh, as time went on, obviously that improved again with more and more exposures, but we'll cover that a little bit later. So some fairly basic modifications. Mechanically, the main thing that was uh, done internally was all the usual lubricants were removed because effectively they would boil off in space. So uh, we didn't want uh, that uh, oxidized material then being deposited on places you don't want it inside the camera. So effectively they were removed. Also plastic parts, if there were any, were replaced with metal. So this modified camera flew with Walter Shearer uh, on Mercury 8. And this was one of his images. There's quite a few, to be honest. We just selected one so you could see. And not bad for a guess of the exposure. Um, could have been focused better maybe, but pretty good, I think. So by the time we then move on to Mercury 9, I think you can see a uh, exposure is much better controlled. And the quality of the images, actually the detail when you zoom in, it's obviously it's a bit difficult on my computer screen that I'm sharing here to show you a fully zoomed in. But on a high res scan of one of the, the uh, negatives, the amount of detail is incredible. Um, now so much so that when NASA actually saw the quality of these, they were getting inquiries from 
different governments and so on for land use pictures and so on. And suddenly they realize the actual benefit of a, a photographic section uh, within the uh, missions that were taking place. Up until then, it had been a, a nice to have, um, but not really uh, have to have. So in this case, they suddenly realized that, yeah, we need to document this. We can get a lot more um, information from the files that we're capturing uh, and we need to try and improve the phot photographic capture. So then we move on to Gemini, two man crew. And again, some very basic uh, requirements moving on from the uh, Mercury mission. So docking in space, obviously, and uh, long durations to see how it affected astronauts. Also, for the images that were being captured, there was now a call for a more uh, magnified view, a more detailed view of the Earth's surface. Uh, so the 250 mil lens was added to the 80 that was on there. And as you can see, this has got the uh, wing modifications to the aperture shutter settings. The 80 obviously had the same to make it easy to change these settings if you're wearing gloves, basically. As time went on, uh, the 500C camera was to be joined by uh, modified SWC. Again, the beauty of this camera is it's very, very small. Uh, you can put a bigger film back on it but also fitted with the Biogon 38, it meant you could get a much wider field of view than the AT and the 250 were giving you on the 500C. So it complemented the, the other system perfectly, especially in the cramped confines of your uh, capsule. It just means you can take more shots inside and then obviously uh, wider views outside. So here's sample image. We can see Ed White doing a spacewalk captured through the capsule um, door, in this case with the 500C. Moving on to Gemini 10, Mike Collins used the SWC and the wide angle uh, 38mm bygone lens and took a selfie. So you can see um, this is at his arm's length, as it were, turning the camera towards him. It's a much wider view enable you to get that within that cramped confines of his capsule. So this is the first indoor selfie in space. A bit of a bone of contention as we'll move along. On a later mission, Mike Collins actually lost his SWC. Uh, so as you can see from this particular image, they were uh, going to be docking with the Agena module. And uh, while he was out on a, on a spacewalk, basically, he lost the camera. Um, as you can see here, it became Sweden's first satellite. Uh, we don't know what happened to it. <laughs> I assume it uh, burnt up on re-entry quite soon after. So as time went through and missions went on, um, the cameras were pushed as further and further. Um, again, with the longer lenses and wider lenses capturing much, much wider views of the Earth. Uh, so this one, as you can see, from 850 miles up, uh, the amount of detail in that one up on the full image is incredible. It's a bit difficult to show you actually on the computer display, sorry, but um, the images are out there for you to look at if you want to. Now, when we move to Gemini 12, uh, we run into Buzz Aldrin. Uh, on a spacewalk, he decided to uh, get in with the selfies and uh, use his SWC to capture this one. Uh, with the Earth behind. Uh, he likes to tell people, because obviously now today astronauts always document their spacewalks um, individually and obviously the team captures it. Uh, but he started the trend, so he likes to say. So Chris, should we, should we put this to the audience then? So yeah, who should have yeah. the, the honour of having the first selfie in space? Is it Michael Collins for within the capsule or should it be Buzz Aldrin because he was actually on a spacewalk? Good to get people's opinion on this. <laughs> so just wait for a few more votes to come in. 
So Michael Collins is winning it with about three quarters <laughs> of the vote at the moment. So just the fact that first, he was actually in place within the capsule, yeah. Okay. So moving on. Sorry, my computer is playing up. So moving on to Project Apollo. We all know about the Saturn V rocket, uh, 363 feet of mostly fuel, let's be honest. Uh, incredible machine. Uh, even today, there's not much that can compare with it. Uh, obviously, I suppose you could say SpaceX uh, with their Falcon Heavy and then the SLS Block 1, Block 2 configurations will be up there with it. So. We're only just coming back in terms of lifting power to what they had there. Amazing machine. So the camera development also moved on. Um, NASA and uh, Hasselblad were now talking. Um, they only really got to know that NASA was using our cameras in space. They knew they'd purchased one, but they didn't know it was actually actively being used right at the beginning. So as the camera development came through, now there was full cooperation going on and NASA was stipulating exactly what they wanted uh, for surface cameras or should we say lunar cameras. Now, these cameras were going to be based on the 500 ELs, uh, again with all of the modifications that you would expect to survive the rigors of space and the lunar surface. Uh, so if I take you through the first one, so this is the Hasselblad electric camera. Again, you can see the uh, similarity to the 500EL. Uh, here you can see the large expanded film back. And again, depending on whether you're running black and white or color will depend on uh, how much or how, how long a piece of film you can put in it due to the diff slight differences in thickness. So black and white, you can get 200. The color was around 170, 180. Um, so there's your bulk film backs. Obviously, the cameras, again, modifications to remove all excess weight in terms of mirrors, secondary shutters, and so on. Again, the lenses are all modified as per the 500C with the little wings, so it's easy to use. Um, and again, motorized film advance compared to the 500C, where astronauts still uh, had to basically wind on the film. Okay. So here we go. Um, talking about the film backs, you can see there was two types. The black type, which are the type that basically stay in the capsule, and silver ones for, were for surface work. Again, to reflect any, uh, uh, when they're in the sun, to reflect as much as possible. And again, they were using specialist film, very ultra thin, with a particular coating to reduce the UV haze effect that I'm sure we've all seen on certain pictures on the surface of the Earth itself. Um, the mainstay was a, a special, basically a Kodak ectochrome for color work. Um, so just to give you an idea, by the time we get to Apollo 7, this is the kit that was going to be uh, brought into use. Obviously for Apollo 7, they carried on using the tried and tested 500C and SWC, but for Apollo 8, which was to be the first mission to orbit the moon, uh, they were given the new cameras, the HECs, so plus the new film backs and full kit. So first try in space for Apollo 8. Now this particular mission, obviously, you probably well know, first to actually orbit the moon and return. Um, some of the images they captured were hugely iconic, but obviously there was a lot of survey work that was also undertaken, one of the images here, of the surface to allow um, planning to take place for a selected uh, landing site for further missions. But I think probably one of the images we've all seen, Earthrise. Uh, there's a good few frames on this one. Uh, I've selected one 
with the Earth a little bit further up, uh, but there are frames of it coming straight over the horizon much tighter, but this one's a nice fit, uh, but very, very iconic. I think you were yeah, going to so, ask another. Um, yeah, Chris, I think it'll be a good one for opportunity to ask the audience um, whether they think it is the most iconic image, maybe, um, or just one of, or not, basically. And just while we're waiting, Chris, I think the actual image is rotated, isn't it? It wasn't it shot 90 degrees? Yeah, so basically um, they were coming round the moon. Uh, so if you imagine that particular moon surface would be on your right hand side and the Earth would appear as they come round. So, yeah, but aesthetically, this this makes a nicer image for everybody. <laughs> yeah. OK, so, yeah, the audience uh, generally agree about 70 percent that is one of the most iconic images. So that's good to know. Good. Thank you. OK. Sorry. OK, so Apollo 9, uh, this was, if you like, a full practice mission for retrieving, docking and undocking with the command module and the lunar module in space. Um, so this was done in Earth orbit and just selected a couple of images to show the two cameras that were being used at the time. So here we can see um, the uh, 500C and an 80 mil planar. Okay, the astronauts there stood on the uh, lunar module end of things. And if I now go to the next image, there we can see uh, the astronaut who just took that frame with his uh, camera in his hand. Not bad considering focusing and exposure was, should we say, I won't say a guess, but it really was point and shoot. So moving on to Apollo 10, this full scale practice. Um, and I have to say, I feel very sorry for this crew in terms of lunar module undocking and moving down towards the surface, very, very close to the surface to test the landing radar. Um, and then having to stop and come back, um, you yeah. know, so close, but unfortunately not for them. So the surface cameras, again, a modified EL. Uh, main differences here, as you can see, instead of being painted black, they're full silver. Specialist 60 mil uh, Biogon lens developed, and this was specifically designed to give very, very flat image plane. So a very accurate reproduction. Uh, also, we would have added a special plate inside, which I'll show you in a second. And then again, camera silver to reflect as much heat as possible and obviously a polarizing filter on the front. So I'm not sure if the quality is good enough, but you hopefully can see the crosses on the Rousseau plate there. And that enabled very, very accurate measurements to be taken from the frames that were captured. Very, the larger cross in the middle allows the center of the image to be worked out very quickly. Okay. And you should see these on basically on every uh, lunar surface image that was taken with the Hasselblad, you will see these crosses. If you see an image that was taken on the surface or inside the capsule, looking out onto the surface, it has no crosses, that would have been taken with one of the standard HEC cameras, which didn't have this glass plate. So this is your standard rollout kit for Apollo 11. And Mike Collins, who remained in the command module, had a, uh, a standard HEC camera, Hasbro Electric, with the 80 mil, a 250, and three magazines. So he could then carry on using the 250 to continue to shoot uh, surface images for future missions. Then the kit that actually went down in the uh, Eagle module, again, you had one more, should we say, capsule camera, the HEC with the 80 and a couple of few magazines, but there was only one of the actual surface camera, uh, plus obviously additional magazines. Just to give you an idea in terms of uh, exposure control, uh, it's fairly basic. 
I mean, literally, sunny 16 rule. Trying to keep it as simple as possible for the astronauts in terms of settings, shutter speed was maintained at 2 50th of a second, so that all they would then need to do would worry about would be the aperture setting for whether the, the craft was in shadow, whether they were in sunlight, etc. And again, they could quickly uh, modify that setting. In terms of surface camera, again, you can see here, it really depended on where was the sun in terms of what exposure they would do. So again, if they were taking images in the shadow of the lunar module, they would need to have a, a wider aperture. Uh, out on the surface in full sunlight, obviously they need to stop down towards 11 or 16 to actually, well, F11, I should say, uh, to, to actually compensate for that. So in addition to the standard uh, surface cameras, work was actually done on uh, a modified SWC for a surface camera to enable super wide images to be captured. Uh, a lot of work went in, you can see here's a prototype there, but actually this camera never made it into use. So here we go, one of the first images taken on the surface. Uh, again, this was with the, the standard uh, Haswell electric camera without the cross plate, the SO plate. And then obviously, more importantly, here's Neil Armstrong coming down the ladder. Uh, I think, you know, again, one of the, more, one of the most iconic moments. Uh, this particular image obviously is grabbed from TV footage. So yeah, it's so iconic, question. yeah, it's one of the most iconic moments in history, I guess. And it'd just be interesting to know how many of our viewers were actually sort of alive and old enough to remember it. Um, I personally wasn't. I don't know about you, Chris. Were you? No. <laughs> no. Um, OK, so we've got a pretty good split, actually. 50% uh, remember it well, roughly, and um, not too many fewer. Um, weren't born so we've got quite a good mix which is interesting good. good luckily it's all recorded and we can actually watch it back yeah okay. okay so once neil had made it to the surface um he was joined obviously by buzz aldrin uh, now the fact that there was only one surface camera uh, which was attached to the commander, which was obviously Neil Armstrong, meant that, unfortunately, there wasn't going to be that many images of Neil. Uh, Buzz Aldrin is in a huge number of images, okay? But this was the first time this camera had actually been used. There was only one, so no backup plan, um, but they committed to use the camera on that mission. Um, we obviously had some trust in the system up at that point, which was good. So now I've decided to show you this one uh, as a full image. Uh, one of the comments we always get is how perfect the images are, how well framed they are. Uh, but if you look at this one, the center of the image, the larger cross is actually on Buzz Aldrin's lower leg. And normally when you see this image used in most publications, it's cropped tight just below um, the bottom of Buzzy's legs. And obviously then that cuts out the landing leg and, and spike. Uh, but as you can see, it's not perfect framing as we're always led to be believe. Um, the images are cropped and, and adjusted afterwards to give you the best images. So obviously they had a very short time on the surface, uh, lots of experiments to set up. Uh, you can see the uh, reflector experiment, the laser ranging experiment in the background that we, which we still use to this day uh, to check the distance to the moon. Uh, the 60 mil allows 
measurements to be taken from these images. That was one of the main things that they had. They knew exactly where image would, would be taken from. And with the crosses set at particular five mil increments across the image, they knew exactly the angle of view and the distances involved. Um, having said that, looking at the banding site there, look how close that is to the uh, crater on the left of the image. Um, quite lucky. Now, obviously, this is probably, again, one of the more iconic images of Buzz saluting the flag. This one, along with the, the footprint, probably are the ones that everybody knows. Um, but before we move on, how many images do you think? You're going to ask a poll on this one. How many images of uh, Neil Armstrong do you think were taken on the moon? Yeah, a bit of a trivia question on this one, just to test everyone's knowledge. So were there no images of Neil? Uh, this is uh, still images, obviously, not the TV footage. Uh, one, five, 17, or more than 20. And this is of all the shots taken on the moon surface. Okay, so quite an interesting spread. Um, okay, so it's currently around about 15% for no images, around about 25% for one, around about 30% for five, 17 is about eight percent and then 18 percent think more than 20. so chris did you want to give the answer i got, got an old split then um actually there was five images uh literally five images that's been joined recently by an image that was pulled from the tv camera um, and actually managed to capture an image of neil with his visor with the gold visor up so you could actually see his face um, this particular one is part of what's called Strut Z Panorama, which was taken by Buzz Aldrin. Uh, again, there's a few images that are normally uh, stacked together here to get the panorama, but this is Neil uh, working, getting something out of the, the cargo section on the lunar module. So this is a nice one. Basically, once the main mission had finished, both of them were back in the capsule and uh, Buzz kindly took an image of Neil uh, with the capsule camera with the 80 mil. Job well done. So then on the way back up to meet Michael Collins, um, who'd been orbiting the moon on his own, probably the, one of the few people on Earth that didn't get to see the landing live, uh, but also as this shot was taken by Mike Collins, pretty much everybody else that existed there and then, as you can see, um, was in the image except for him. So that's one for his diary. So obviously, as we moved on beyond Apollo 11, uh, Apollo 12 to 17, again, different landing sites uh, selected and missions grew and grew in terms of A, the technical uh, requirements. So this particular image, you can see the lunar rover, the number of cameras went up. So there was at least one camera for each of the astronauts, plus many additional film backs. Okay, so more and more images. And obviously each mission had extended stays compared to the original. Now, obviously, Apollo 13, unfortunately, had the uh, oxygen tank explosion. And couldn't actually land, had to slingshot and return to Earth. But even then, they uh, used the camera to actually take images as they orbited the moon coming around the once uh, to get what they could of their landing site. So just a couple of little images just to show you what moved on. So this is Apollo 16, Charlie Duke uh, on a sample collection. Uh, this is their main EVA. And I've put an insert there of a close-up of the camera on the chest mount, uh, just so you can see it was very, very easy for the astronauts to use. Uh, literally, they would just select, with even with their gloved hand, they could select the correct aperture, rough focusing distance, and then the large button at the front meant that the very, very simple to trigger an exposure. Um, in terms of framing, yeah, it was a guess, uh, literally, lean back, lean forward and press the button. But with the training that they've done on Earth prior to going on the missions, they all had a rough idea of 
you know how much the field of view was with the 60 mil lens and roughly what they were going to get if they if they were leaning in a certain direction so uh, they had quite a bit of experience by the time they actually got to the moon and were shooting images hence why most of them are pretty good so moving on uh, Apollo 17 obviously uh, last one unfortunately and this particular image is literally one of the last images to be taken out of the capsule window uh, with the surface camera. Um, all of the bodies and lenses uh, were left, except for one, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, obviously, that excludes the Apollo 13 cameras because they obviously didn't go down to the surface. They stayed in the capsule. Um, but at the moment, there's uh, lenses, you know, 12 camera bodies and their lenses are still sat up there. Basically, too much weight. Should we say they were left behind so they could more bring back more of a lunar um, moon rock. One particular camera um, did come back, Apollo 15 mission. Uh, the film back was stuck. They could not remove it. Uh, so that particular one had to come back, uh, much to their upset. But obviously, they're going all the way back to Hasselblad for, uh, to be looked at and repaired to be able to remove that film back. Uh, and all it was in the end was a very, very small gear had come loose on a shaft. Nothing else had gone wrong. This is probably one of the most iconic images that most people see. And it was Apollo 17, where actually the full Earth was captured. Up until then, the Earth had been captured, but it wasn't a fully illuminated uh, because the course, the sun position, etc., hadn't allowed the full uh, Earth to be captured. So that's why th this particular image has got a nickname of the, the blue marble. But it didn't end there. Uh, most people who think about Hasselblad and moon cameras probably think that's it. Uh, but actually, we, we carried on many, many years after that. So Skylab missions, the equipment was used uh, as per through Apollo. Uh, if you look at this particular image, you can see the crosshairs all over the image. So you can see that that's a, a lunar type or surface type camera was used to shoot that. But obviously, the camera designs had to move on to reflect um, more requirements. And so by the time we get on to Apollo Soyuz missions around 75, you can see that you know, bigger prisms are, are being put on, one that can be put either way round, so that basically the astronaut could shoot over the shoulder if necessary. So focusing, because the images were being shot closer up in capsules in the Skylab unit itself, uh, they needed to be focused. So again, now you've got a viewfinder which allows you to do that. Time moves on and we move up to the space shuttle era. And this obviously goes up to around 2002 for us. Um, cameras had moved on in terms of electronics, etc. cetera, um, slightly more compact units. And again, because uh, uh, technology had moved on, we've also got data recording for things like date, times, etc. You can see the recording unit here sat above the film, film back. So if I move on, just to give you a few test images now. Um, so here you can see that particular camera that we've just looked at, again, with the data recording unit above the film back. Again, this is being used for Earth survey, uh, and that was to become a um, a major part of the program and usage of Hasselblad cameras was Earth Survey. So the cameras themselves were used to record in high resolution most of the external missions. Uh, this could be either outside or through the rear uh, view windows. Again, the shuttle cargo bays are huge. So you know, again, high resolution images are, uh, are needed to be able to capture full detail of what's going on. So here we can see uh, mission specialist Donald Peterson and Story Musgrove basically testing out things like the handrail system of the shuttle Challenger during one of their EVAs on uh, STS-6. So going back to some iconic images, 
This one is Bruce McCandless uh, testing out the MMU, the Man Maneuvering Unit. So untethered flight in space. Uh, I've picked this one because it's closer up. There's a fantastic image of him at, at that 320 feet away, uh, but he's a tiny little dot. So I thought in fairness, I'd pick one where he was closer. Um, very brave, but I bet that was fantastic. So again, the benefits of the high resolution capture, uh, we can see the Hasselblad here with the 250 mil lens uh, being used to capture various uh, specific targets on Earth service. Uh, and these images were then used by various governments and agencies for you know, land use, etc. Some quite interesting combinations. Um, if we look at this one, you can see a, a, a dual use Hasselblad, various films and filters. So again, two images being taken, so stereographic, um, and then can, can be compared on this particular one. But these are literally just off the shelf uh, 553s with, again, tapes and, and tags to basically stop the things from floating around when you don't want them to be. But again, they're pretty close to an off the shelf camera. So these cameras continued in use with a few modifications uh, as we go forward. So uh, here's one, uh, STS-59, so this is 1994. Uh, again, this particular set of cameras we used to do huge, huge uh, survey of the Earth's surface to get a massive amount of data. So moving on to the future, we've got uh, then Shuttle and Mir. Uh, this was taken by one of the uh, shuttle crew as the uh, shuttle was moving up to dock. Um, this is probably a better picture for you. So you can see it docked with the Mir station there. Uh, but the cameras themselves weren't just confined to the shuttle. So NASA equipped uh, the space, pa spa sorry, space pallet satellite with various cameras, one of which was a 70 mil Hasselblad. Uh, now this particular unit could be detached from the shuttle uh, and left floating in space to capture images from whatever angle was required. Uh, obviously not just of the shuttle, but of the Earth's surface. So again, if a particular longer term survey was required that it, it could be left floating and then picked up at a later stage. So that's the uh, pallet satellite. And obviously this one, are some of the images, it's just one selected image. Again, you can see the crosses uh, from the Resso plate on the camera. And then this is uh, showing the shuttle Challenger. There are many images out there uh, taken with this system. Uh, it just allows them to get high resolution images of the orbiter and the earth very, very simply. One of the best, or if you like, most fantastic projects, obviously, that the cameras were used to record was the launch and unfortunately subsequent repair of the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. So moving on. Again, taken from the rear deck of the shuttle, uh, huge, huge high resolution images to capture the work that was being done uh, over the various um, three repair missions and upgrade mission. And again, unfortunately, probably my laptop screen sending you the signal is not going to give you the highest resolution view, but um, these images are out there. And then we're up to 1999 at this point. Uh, so again, upgrade mission, uh, third upgrade mission, I think this particular one. And then finally, the space shuttle uh, involved in obviously putting together the initial modules that formed the basis of the International Space Station. So here's the first two chunks. Um, the US Unity module connecting to the uh, Russian built Zyra module uh, joined up. And then obviously from this, it grew and grew and grew as more modules were added and various docking mechanisms. Uh, 
Hasselblad cameras themselves were actually in use on the shuttles and to a certain extent on the International Space Station all the way up until 2002. So again, you can see some basics here. The last mission that had a Hasselblad camera that successfully returned to Earth was uh, December 2002, which is SCS-113. Um, the cameras did fly on another particular mission, but unfortunately the uh, orbiter was lost along with the crew. So. It was at that point, obviously, that uh, digital was coming on stream and very, very early on, medium format uh, digital cameras were not the most compact of units. And so a decision was made to try a more compact digital system at that point, a smaller format. Um, one of the major advantages was that being digital, you could send the captures and the information back before the actual mission returned to Earth so that you could get images as you go on particular experiments and so on, which is very useful to scientists. So moving on to the future, who, who knows what uh, that holds for Hasselblad? You know, we have various commercial companies coming on stream or on stream now and SpaceX, Boeing, etc. Uh, you never know, uh, Hasselblad camera might end up going back to the moon shortly, uh, may even be on Mars, but uh, you never know. Um, but we made an offer with the moon cameras. Um, anybody that managed to get one and bring it back, we'll, we'll service it and give them a free film bank. Um, I think you've got just a poll mark. Yeah, just on that note, um, you know, just, just a, again, no wrong or right answer really, but um, just to gauge the audience feedback as to what should mankind prioritize really for the future you know would people like to see us return to the moon explore that some more or should we instead turn our attention to mars um or should we do neither this will be an interesting one what do you think chris both <laughs> yeah well both is winning both is about 50 percent at the moment and then mars about 30 percent moon roughly 13, 14, and 9% uh, say we shouldn't uh, prioritise either. So that's good to know. Okay. Thank you for everyone for voting. Good. So moving on to the final slide. Uh, if I can get the system to work. Hasselblad themselves, we, we learned an awful lot in terms of the cooperation with NASA uh, and what's required um, in terms of Okay, not specifically what's required for a camera for space because there's some very specifics, but in terms of compact, build quality, huge optical quality and accurate color reproduction or something, the lessons that were learned all the way through, you know, even into our current systems, you, you know, H6D, X1D2. Um, so again, from an image quality uh, update, up to date design, uh, it would be good that you can have a look at our current systems, but a lot of the expertise that we have there was learned through uh, the systems that we tried out on the NASA cameras. That's over to you, Mark. Yeah, well, we'll just take um, some questions if you don't mind, Chris. Sure. I've had quite a few coming in throughout the presentation, so thanks very much. Um, okay. A lot of questions uh, regarding uh, the, the type of film that was used, especially, uh, like you mentioned, the, the Kodachrome or whatever um, for the Apollo, but what about Gemini? Was that the same? Um, yes, yeah, so the positive, film... negative, and what was the nice? Again, so basically negative films, uh, mainly because you've got uh, more latitude, um, be it black and white or color. And again, they were specifically made by Kodak uh, to uh, a to be an ultra thin film base. Again, the thinner the film, the more exposures you can actually load per film back. Um, and then again, the coatings, UV coating um, specifically on that. Um, so the color film was extra chrome and uh, I can look up the um, black and white one. It's a very specific make. Okay. And um, did radiation in, in affect the film at all emissions? Uh, no, obviously. Um, Depending on where the actual film backs were used, you know, if, we, if we're talking about, uh, say, the capsule cameras, Gemini, Mercury, and so on, um, most of the time you're inside the capsule, you're not out. But if you're out in space, 
uh, it's a short amount of time. So sure, you 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 may encounter some uh, cosmic rays, solar energetic particles, and so on. But you know, more effect really is probably where you'll get in terms of the heat shifts. Uh, now that's specifically the case with the surface cameras where we talk about the moon. The whole point of the camera being silver was to reflect as much sunlight as possible because obviously the temperature range as you were going from shadow behind a lunar module, let's say, out into full sun, uh, it's a big shift. But obviously the camera takes time to go from one temperature to the other. So that's why you don't see such a huge issue with heat because the camera itself being fully metal, that heat gets uh, spread as it heats up through the whole body. It's not just a film back. So you don't get the sort of typical heat effects that you'd get by leaving, a, you know, if, if we're back on earth and we leave a color film out in the sun, it would be massively heat affected. But you don't get that because obviously the back and the metal body protects the actual uh, film inside that film back from the huge changes in temperature. Okay, and along similar lines about the dust as well, was there any dust contamination? Uh, contamination? Yes. <laughs> uh, obviously, the film backs were changed, and um, the particular uh, uh, makeup of the camera, the glass plate, the reso plate, was right at the rear of the camera body. So obviously, when you then um, removing dark slide from the particular particular film back you're trying to attach. If you're not careful or if there's dust in the module and you're just swapping over, it is possible to get some lunar dust basically on the reso plate. And if you look at some of the images that are out there, you can see where that's happened. And um, as the dark slide has been uh, removed, effectively it's scratched or put uh, dust onto some of the reso plate. And so all of the subsequent images have either got the exact same uh, scratch or dust mark in a particular place. Now, obviously, the final images that get released have all been touched up to remove that. But if you look at the actual originals, you can see that. So they had to okay, be very great. careful in terms of moving dust off their suits and everything else and try to be as clean as you possibly can. But, you know. OK, uh, quite a photography based question, this. Um, did the moon's surface provide a good 18% grey for colour balancing? <laughs> uh, well, you would think so, but the problem is that the, um, depending on the angle you're shooting from, the loon, uh, moon's uh, regolith, the, the soil surface, basically is a lovely reflector. So there's a huge amount of light actually bouncing off that. Um, so it's not going to be quite what you want. I mean, that's one of the reasons why there's so much fill on a lot of the shots. You know, you don't get the contrast range that you think you would get. It's because there's so much fill light coming from the surface where it's bouncing the light around. OK, um, could you talk a little bit more about how the um, astronauts were trained to use the cameras in terms of focusing and um, composition, um, especially yeah. the focus? Yeah, so, you know, effectively, we're, we're talking other than the 250, everything was a wide angle lens. So either the 60 or the 38 mil biogons, being wide angle, there's a, a fair degree of, um, shall we say, leeway for focus. So, you know, if I'm setting the aperture to F8 or F11, and I, I move the, the focusing lever to three meters, let's say, at F8 to 11, you know, you've got a fair depth of field there. So anything from, you know, two meters to 20 meters at least is in focus, uh, if not more. Um, so again, depth of field was used to great effect here, especially with the biog on the 38 mil, um, you could get away with murder with that. Um, the 60 mils that were surface based, again, most of the images were focused, so we say slightly further away, three to five meters. And again, that helped with, with depth of field. Okay, um, and terms, also like shooting, Sorry. So I was going to say uh, another question was about shooting through glass as well from like the capsule and the shuttle and that in the, in the future. Um, was that a challenge for the photographers? Well, the astronauts, I mean? No, because it, uh, the cameras were manual focus. So you, you, you know, they were judging a particular distance. Yes, I mean, they're shooting through uh, a fair chunk of glass, should we say, uh, but Optically, it's relatively straightforward to shoot. And by the time we get to the shuttle, um, you've got viewfinders and you can actually see what you're focusing on anyway. So it's not like you're focusing blind there. Uh, with the earlier ones, um, 
obviously shooting outside was simple it's just a guess um, shooting through the glass uh, at the the distances they were talking about you know it doesn't matter okay. that makes sense um were there any special filters on the lenses like polarizing filters or anything like that yeah polarizing filter was used you know, on, on a lot of them especially the lunar surface shots uh as you saw from the camera picture i showed you there was a particular a polarizer fitted to that again with a, a very simple uh a wing adjustment to, to try and adjust the actual polarizing section um, or a small amount of movement there. Now, uh, different uh, types of dark slide we use with various filters initially to work out which which would give the best result in terms of some of the earth imagery. Or you, you know, you know, maybe if it's black and white film, red filter and so on will bring out certain types of uh, detail. And so, yeah, various filters were tried. OK. A um, bit of a, a more modern day question, really. Um, how would uh, someone use one of our modern cameras, so an H6D or an X1D, to photograph the moon themselves? Um, would the That's results be good? Very, and how could they yeah, very good. I mean, it depends on... Uh, uh, I've done it myself. Uh, so X1D, basically, uh, you can attach that directly to the back of a telescope. Um, and then shoot through the telescope. Obviously, the main thing is you want the focal length. Um, so normally, you know, something around the 1500 to 2000 mil will get you fairly close with the X1D on the back. Uh, but obviously the size of the sensor, the resolution means that if you can't quite get that close, you can still get a really good image and then just crop. Um, for me particularly, if you've got that camera on the back of your telescope, again, live view comes in and then you've got things like focus peaking, makes focusing on the moon surface and so on really easy. Okay, great. Um, just one more, I think, before we finish. Um, someone asked um, on Apollo 13, they'd heard that maybe the camera um, was used to help save their lives and get them back um, to, to Earth. Are you aware of that? I have to say, I wasn't aware of that one. Okay. That's, That's going to be a good so one to, to look up then. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. That's that's pretty much uh, all we've got time for, I think. Um, if we can just uh, hand back to me and I'll just finish us off. Sorry. There we go. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so thanks for that, Chris. And um, just before we go, if I can just um, have a little bit of a shout out for our next webinar, which is next uh, Tuesday, the 5th of May, and it's going to be on our focus uh, software and apps. Um, so um, explaining the difference between our desktop versions and our mobile versions It's going to be hosted by our team in the US. Um, it's going to be at three o'clock British summer time, as I say, Tuesday the 5th, and you can register for that on our website. Uh, if you require any more information on Hasselblad products uh, or request a private demo, more information on our partner network, and more sort of information on our history, like what Chris has been going through with the space and some inspirational stories, uh, head over to our website, Hasselblad.com. Um, so that's pretty much us, and we, uh, we hope you enjoyed the webinar, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you again at another one soon. Thank you very much.